Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is where you can go to learn about the double bass. And I am on a really special trip to uh, Music City, Nashville, over in Tennessee in the USA. And it was on my list to meet up with some prominent, you know, amazing players who have inspired me along the years. And I've been joined by one of them today, and you will know them as somebody who has been named the International Bluegrass Music Association Bass Player of the Year nine times. I'm hoping they're going to go for number 10. We'll see. <laughs> um, their Grammy-nominated uh, album, Royal Traveller, was released back in 2018, and it saw them move from the out of the shadows with a songwriting uh, role as well as collaborations with some of the greatest artists in the Nashville music scene and some very special bass players that we'll be talking about in just a moment. I'm also a personal fan of the First Ladies of Bluegrass, which is an incredible supergroup of the you know, Nashville scene's greatest uh, artists. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome somebody who also, I've just remembered, has their own online bass school, which you should be sure to check out. It's the great Missy Rain. So Missy, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much. What, a, what an introduction. Thank you. Yeah, well, you've done so much. And as I say, you've got nine times with the uh, IBMA Bass Player of the Year. That must be a real joy. Oh, it, it's indescribable. Um, it does. It, it is. It does. It has brought me a lot of joy, um, and it's felt felt really great and warm and fuzzy to be acknowledged by your peers. So it feels really great. And it's voted for by the members of the association. So yeah. you're, you know, it's just a yeah, it's a terrific accolade. And as I say, let's hope that we get into double digits. I'm sure that we'll uh, <laughs> we'll get there for number ten. And uh, yeah, congratulations on the release of Royal Traveller. That was back in 2018, and and it features. Is it all? No, it's a mixture of your compositions. As, uh, is that right? That's right. Um, yeah, I've, I wrote or co-wrote several of the songs on there, but I also covered some really great songs. And so, yeah, it was just a. It, it was, um, but all the songs written, both written and chosen, were um, kind of fit a theme for me at the time. Um, uh, so it, they were. They were tied in connection in some way or another, so in my mind at least, conceptually. Yeah. It's a really um, incredible record, and one of the uh, pieces on there, which includes the wonderful Alison Brown, as well as two incredible pillars of the Nashville Bay scene, Todd Phillips and Mike Bubb. So, Darling Pal of Mine, the Flatten Scruggs song, uh, you covered in this video, and this is the one thing that I think I really want everybody to do at the end of this, is go and check out this video, and we'll provide links you know, below this video so you can watch this one, because it is so, so unique <laughs> and so cool, because I think it's got story, it's got interesting people, and it's got really cool bass playing in. Um, so, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about coming together, who, in fact, where do you get the idea from? Well, that that credit goes to Alison Brown because that, that right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, totally. Take it, leave it to a banjo player, right? Yeah, to sure. come up with the great bass story. So, um, but Alison produced the the whole album, mm. and um, as I said, like I had sort of chosen all these other songs with the lyrics for that had a um, some meaning or another for me at that time. Um, but then we, she and I both knew that we needed to record an instrumental and, and, and she's like, I'm a banjo player, you're a yeah. bass player, we have to do something. And, and then we, and it kind of like, it was just a couple of minutes before we said, well, we know what we have to do. We have to do, you know, the great duo between Jack Tulloch and Earl Scruggs and you know, try to do something with that. Um, that very iconic bit of music that they recorded. And that video, um, the, the video performance that I've found of that, it's so, the bass playing is so energetic and, uh, you know, Jack Tuck's moving around and kind of, yeah. you know, it's it's a really incredible, uh, yeah, it's a really incredible performance. I think it, I think it, it shines a light on, on um, the relationship between the two of them too, also between, you know, we think of Flat Scruggs and then there was the band. And of course, if you're really in, into the to, to the bluegrass sort of history, you know that the band is more than just a backup band. But that video definitely like brings that together because like they're it's really interacting, you know, with each other with a lot of respect and um and and but also a very it's very comedic and so um, which is which is a part of what Jake Tulloch is actually listed in his um, his actual bio when he's in he's listed in the bluegrass music hall of fame as a comedian as well as a bass player so it, 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 it 
it fits. But the way, that, you know, Allison had the idea that, that it would be really fun to just take, you know, one bass and six hands to create something on the bass. And then once we decided that it would be this tune, then we, <laughs> so, you know, first of all, I had to find like people who were willing to do this, you know, to, to um, uh, you know this because it suddenly it went from sort of being kind of musical to being actual physical you know like trying to physically figure out how we were going to take one instrument and dodge each other and you know um, so for those who haven't seen uh, <laughs> seen how it works just just describe the interaction and uh, that, so people can get a clear idea of what you're talking about well, here at with first, three bass players and one bass yeah at first we were I mean literally I was just talking you know trying to explain to them and they were just kind of laughing at me like like I don't even we don't even know where to begin but um, so the idea was to have a call and answer between the three of us, but each of us played the same instrument. So that meant that, you know, one person is sort of playing a lick, and then they we literally move out of the way so the next person comes and plays a lick, and it's just got to be spot on and really fast. So we had to, we basically choreographed it. I mean, we had to figure out where people were going to go after they played their little lick and then come back around and get in line to play another lick. And we, and we recorded it that way. Um, the whole first part of the song, which you can hear, um, you know, different. I mean, we kind of sound very similar because we're all playing the bass, but yet you can tell, you can, you can tell by licks and you can tell by tone, you know, that it's three different hands playing it. And, and, and so there, the funniest part of it was that, of course, there were some missed moments and there's, you know, moments when people ran, you know, like I ran into like someone's forearm because I'm short and, you know, or somebody knocked, got knocked in the head with an elbow or something like that. So there's stuff like that happening. And it made for a really fun day in the studio. Um, and then it also, after a while, we were like, okay, we have to figure, we really have to figure out how to do this. And so we, we just did. And then we just, you know, it just, it just happened. So it's a studio recording and then you recreated it for the video. Is that, is that the way it works? Because we, I, I couldn't, yeah. obviously the video is set in two locations. So, right. You know. So the video, we, we, um, we, yeah, we had to kind of remember what we did. So we actually got together and tried to remember what we did. And, and um, we did the video that way at the Station Inn and had lots of really special guests come in and be there with us for that. So that was really fun and magical as well. Was it during the day? Was it, did you, I mean, what I mean was, was the Station Inn op open to the public? Was it part of a concert or did you just go in and when it was closed up and recreate it? Was, it was closed. We did it by invitation and, oh, and so brought people cool. in. And, 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 and it was an incredible... It was probably one of the coldest days in Nashville ever. Oh, wow. And you and I don't think you can actually tell that because we're yeah. actually standing outside at some point. It looks beautiful and sunny. From we're there, freezing. Yeah. Oh, okay. We are absolutely completely freezing. And um, there even we even had heaters like uh, uh, Allison brought in heaters for the outside yeah. because it was so cold. Um, but I don't think you can actually tell that. But you may be able to now that I've mentioned it. It's a, good, well, it's a it, serious it was really production. Fun. I was I was saying to you earlier about how how ambitious it was because it's the kind of project that you could spend a long time on, and it could it could you know it's a very complicated project to record you know the the artistry in performing it, but then also trying to recreate it and visually it's you know it's stunning, and it features. Um, of course, the station in which is the you know the home of country music here in Nashville is really is a key part of the uh, uh, bluegrass music um, uh, you know uh, yeah. part of the scene and two very special guests. So why don't you talk to me about the bass players um, that you were joined by Mike Bub, Mike Bub and Todd Phillips? So. Yeah. So what did they say when you rang? Did you ring them or there was a text message, <laughs> guys? <laughs> um, I'm not sure who it was. It was if it was me or Allison or both of us that ganged up on them. But um, yeah. I have to say, so you know, it's first of all, those guys are they're just obviously they're angels, and they they were had great spirits about it. Um, it Todd Phillips, for me, just even sitting here thinking about this, that I had him play this on this record with me um, because you know Todd is someone who changed. The way I played, like I remember when I first heard him on Tony Rice's Manzanita album in, in the um, late 70s, and that was a, a, a life changer, a game changer. Um, 
and heard him on lots of, of Tony's albums during around that time, but the one that really sort of changed it for me was that Manzanita album. He did, and 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 so so then to you know years and years later to actually get to know him as a friend and and um, have him be on in such a cool way. Have on have him be on the album is really amazing. And and then there's Mike Bubb, who has been my friend for years and years and years, and we've sort of. Um, grown up together in the as as it, within the the industry and um, just he's he's just been um, such a great friend and and someone that's always there for you he's always there for everyone in the community so that's the the greatest thing about um, what I love about the bass players and all the musicians in this town but and, and not just in this town but just within in music you know there's just there's just this element of people that are always there for you. And so it was great to have both of them on there. And, and truly, it had to be people that were willing to just sort of, you know, go the extra mile. Oh, definitely. It's one of those great examples of kind of, you know, teamwork bringing something really special. And I think it's, honestly, it's one of my all-time favorite, you know, uh, videos. And it was so unexpected. And I, um, I've been planning this trip to Nashville for some time. And um, it was delayed due to uh, COVID and what have you. And just for me, learning about the Nashville bass scene and, you know, Todd Phillips and Mike Burb and yourself and all these other wonderful artists here, it's great to see the collaboration. And, and I love when it cuts to the, uh, to the station in and you've got the, uh, the gentleman in the red shirt is in the audience. He's just so excited. And you, you can just see the, uh, you know, the, the passion in the room and everyone's just having a great time. And um, will you ever create it live? That was where I was. That's my question for you. <laughs> when, are you going to have you're going to have to maybe at some kind of base event or something. Maybe, the, you know, things will collide in some way and come together and you'll be, you know, we'll get. I don't think you're going to get three bass players uh, in the one room at the same time, but it might happen. You know, it would be awesome to see one it day. Would, it would be. We we thought about trying to do it that uh, on the 2019 is when it was actually up for and won um, for recorded our instrumental recording of the year, and we. Um, Thought about trying to be available if they should ask us to perform it, um, but uh, Mike was playing in, in Hawaii or something. I don't sure. know. Yeah, <laughs> he couldn't be there, so organizing I don't know. three we'll see. three bass players on one night is going to be difficult. What are you? What are you going to be? Yeah, bored? it's not. It's not impossible, but I don't know. Gosh, I don't even know. If there, there's some really fun uh, personal videos I have of us trying to do it and 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 just laughing. It's like it's like a game of up, you know bass twister or something you know and you all play so beautifully it's really not i think that's the other nice thing is that it, you know it's, and you can listen to the recording and you can you know, on, on all it's obviously one of the tracks on world travel traveler as well as being on a youtube video but you can listen and you can hear the way that everyone does bring something different you know yeah. and mike plays a kind of small swinging line and it sort of changes the feel slightly when he comes in and mm -hmm. uh, yeah i love the story so um yeah certainly highly recommended please go and check that out so missy just bringing it back and let's maybe talk a little bit about uh your background so people can learn more about um you and your playing um and we'll talk about your teaching maybe as well but let's start with this bass because i've been sort of holding back from asking you questions uh in the green room uh about the instrument because it's just so cool you know it's a First of all, wh where did you get it from? What's the instrument? Um, well, it's a uh, it's a 1937K. Cool. And um, well, let me just talk a little bit more about it, and then yeah. I'll tell you about where I got it from. So you can see, obviously, it's been decorated. It's been yeah. Do you painted. want to turn it a little yeah, bit so we can? It's just, yeah. It's been painted, and um, it's actually this dark color is actually like a a, a stain or a varnish okay. that wow. somebody p put on it. Um, and then they painted these notes on it, and of course, this is just um, this is just me years yeah. of, of rubbing there with my thumb and stuff. But um, the actual color, I'm trying to find a place where it might show oh, the actual yeah. the actual color. Oh, so, look at that! So this, if you, I don't know if you can see, just this bit of, of curly maple mm. um, right here. And that's what the whole base looks like wow. underneath all of this. So they, they must have painted it like white, like this cream color, and yeah. then they put a, a stain over top of it. Don't ask me why they did this, but because um, it has, um, it's, it was one of the higher models of the time um, with, with real purfling in yeah. it and a three-piece neck. It's beautiful. Um, 
which has been broken, all in my care, and thank you. And, um, and then the, 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 the brass... Um, it's cool, it's just plates. Plates are uh. engraved, and not all of the Ks are. Um, so it's got things about it that are, that just made it kind of like this extra super, mo super model um, at the time. And um, it's very thin, thin body. Yeah. Um, so it, and it's one of the first Ks that, that Kay made. It's in, in the first probably year or two of, of when they were making Kay. And Kay was a company that was in, at the time in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay. And so they were making all, uh, a lot of different instruments. And then um, they, the company eventually was bought out by Engelhart. So, mm. so they no longer uh, make Kay instruments anymore. But um, so the story is that I, I grew up in northeastern West Virginia, and my father, uh, my parents were into bluegrass, and that's how I got into to bluegrass. Was they were going to see music long before I was born, but mm. they didn't they didn't really play music. But my dad apparently decided that he might like to play bass, and so he, I was sort of playing guitar and piano at the time, and and very much into bluegrass, but not thought about the bass at all. So my dad actually bought this bass, this one, for himself. Wow. And he brought it home. And um, I, apparently he did not discuss this purchase with my mom beforehand because he, he came home and literally stood at the foot of the stairs with it in his hand like this and called for my mom. And I went with my mom to the, to the top of the stairs. Well, and how old were you, Missy? Sorry. I was probably like probably. 10 and a half or wow. something like that. And, and I remember I looked at him and I was like, oh my God. And yeah. then I looked at my mom and she looks at him and they exchange this glance. Yeah. Like, and at first she said something like, what have you done? Yeah. <laughs> and, but then I could see the glint in her eyes. Like I could see the smiling in her eyes and I could tell that it was all really cool. Anyway, he, he was smiling. They brought the bass up. So there's a bass in the house now. And at the time, we were going to, um, uh, to festivals, but also to, to jam sessions in the winter with neighbors and, and, and to square dances. And there weren't very many basses. In fact, I don't think that there had been a bass in our circle of fr immediate friends. And so the bass is suddenly there. My dad's sort of playing it. Well, then I decided to, to play it. And I had some guitar knowledge, so I had a friend show me, you know, I could follow the guitar chords. And then I just fell in love with it. And I just kind of stopped thinking about the guitar. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you did. It's just <laughs> a real, I mean, it's a wonderful instrument. It's, I, when I think about bluegrass music and, uh, you know, I think about American standards and the K basses and, to, I didn't realize it was as old as it is. It's a, it's incredible. It's a real, yeah, a real stunning, stunning bass, and it sounds awesome. It's got this really lovely, rich. I like the way you play. It. You have a very sort of smooth, connected kind of way of, uh, of, of it sounds very uh, well, just really beautiful. Do you mind playing a little bit of the lower register so we can hear yeah. one or two of these? Yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's about that you sort of slid in there. And it's got this. It's, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's got for given that it's not a solid bass and like it's it's actually made of plywood. So yeah. given that it does have that uh, plywood, um, I, I just think that it, it sounds really full to me. But I think it's just it's also because it's so dried out. You know, it's so old, and so that helps it a lot. And then you can actually get that sort of punch. You know, so. that bluegrass kind of punch as well. Or you can. You know, I don't think people will really, you know, you don't get this on camera in the way that you do when you're in the room, but it's very, yeah. Yeah, you can get that if you want, if you, if you, if you work for it, but then you can also, it has, I think it was, this bass was built to play more of that percussive mm. sound like this. And, and not really to be played like with that sustain. Yeah. But it still has kind of a nice little growl to it for a, a plywood bass. I'm, well, we've been working with 
plywood bases all week and I'm absolutely <laughs> loving the sound. It's, yeah. You don't tend to see as many of them in um, in the UK. So I think, you know, really? certainly I've, I've never actually, I mean, I may have played the occasional cave. I've never seen an American standard in person before, I don't mm. think. And, and anyway, I just love the sound. I, I think that it's got a, in a way that it will work for jazz and for bluegrass and, you know, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous sound. So, yeah, a very cool instrument. And I know people are always interested in the equipment. Tell us a little bit about what we have uh, down here in terms of strings and microphones and pickups and things. Yeah, so um, I have, well, this actually right here is a, um, I'll turn the bass around so you can yeah. see. This is um, a Fishman pickup. It's a full circle pickup. So it, it takes the place of one of the uh, bridge extenders. And... Um, and I really like that. I really like the the the, the pickup it, when I need a like a, the ad addition of a pickup sound. Yeah. Um, but I also have um, the thing that I I really love is this uh, ear trumpet Nadine microphone. And so what I'm actually using most of the time, and then, then this is a um, this is a little microphone, a little lavalier mic that, that I'm, I'm, so most of the time I'm running the combination of the ear trumpet Nadine and this little microphone. And that's what I'm using um, in combination with uh, the two when I perform live. So um, yeah, I love the Nadine. It's just, it's just been. So do you run that into, into directly to an amplifier then? That goes, do you, do you have to use a, 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 some kind of mixer or something? Or do you just use it on its own? Or I just, I, I use it pretty, um, on, on its own. I don't really use an amp these days. Yeah. I haven't used an amp for a, for a while. I mean, right now, the band I'm touring with, um, I don't have drums or electric guitar or anything, mm. so I'm not using an amp. Um, when, I, when I have toured with those things, um, I would, I I would run it. I I I, I would use an amp for on stage, but I pr mm. I probably wouldn't run this through the amp. I would just run it yeah. straight to the house. Yeah. You know. I said the other thing is it's one of the coolest looking microphones as well. <laughs> I know, I know. They he he's got a great aesthetic. Philip Graham at, at Ear Trumpet. They 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 have a great aesthetic look about them as well. Um, but they also just really sound super great. So. So you have the bass, you're uh, starting to find your way around. Who were the kind of players who were inspiring you that maybe somebody who, like me, who knows, you know, uh, is fairly new to bluegrass, uh, might be looking for, I'm thinking of, you know, who, who are the names that are jumping out to you that you can remember being inspired by and maybe emulating their sound? Well, you know, it, it just depends on which, which decade you're talking <laughs> about. Because, you know, the first, that, those first years, you know, um, I was, I completely uh, w was intrigued by Tom Gray, who played with the Country Gentleman and, and, and the Seldom Scene. But um, he was, by the time I was really playing, he was playing with the Seldom Scene. But what I was, but, but, I, but before that, I was listening to the records that he was on with the Country Gentleman because the Country Gentleman happened to be one of my parents' fav favorite bands, so that was on the stereo constantly. And yeah. so I grew up on that music. And he's known for a very um, uh, busy style, and especially in those days. He, he doesn't play so much that way anymore, but his style was very, it's kind of like a lot of... Yeah. You know, like a very, yeah. like a walking, it's kind of, which which was, um, he was inspired by George Shuffler, who played with the Stanley Brothers. Yes. He played guitar and bass, but um, is probably most known for his guitar playing, but was a great bass player. And he also played a, a great walking style. So Tom was influenced by George. And I definitely, my, my earliest um, inspiration was Tom and that style. Um, but then later, I started listening to um, lots of other players, including Todd Phillips, you know, the work that I started listening to um, uh, Tony Rice and, and, and David Grisman as they were doing more of the dog music scene, and that really inspired me. So that opened up a lot of doors to jazz for me. So then I started listening to um, folks like early on Ron Carter and 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 Ray Brown and and Dave Holland um, and Dave Holland had actually done some work here in town uh, with folks like Vassar Clements and and 
um, there was there's an early recording that I got a hold of somehow, um, probably just because it had Sam Sam Bush on it. But there's a, it doesn't have a name, but the there it just has all the artists: Sam Bush, Tut Taylor, Vassar Clements, Norman Blake, and Dave Holland. And I'm I'm missing somebody, I'm sure. But um, anyway, it's a it's a great album. It's completely yeah. out of print. And um, but I heard that, and that was also really life changing because. I was listening to all these artists that I was familiar with in, within the bluegrass country genre playing with a bass player who was clearly like a jazz player. And, um, and that blew my mind because just hearing how they placed the notes and where they placed the notes and their note choices and all of those things changed everything because I'd been listening to all these bluegrass records with all these bluegrass bass players. And that was great, but th then hearing you know that different perspective of of a jazz player playing with yes. a music that I it wasn't just like listening to jazz, which was a whole nother experience, but it was listening to these jazz players playing music that I recognized, and so that changed everything for me. Um, and then it went on, and then of course I I was late to the party, but of course folks like Roy Husky Jr. and yeah. and those guys, um, um, I learned the value of just one note. Yeah, yeah, that classic sound, the, <laughs> the Bob Moores, the Wojcicki yeah. Jr. and yeah. That stuff, and, mm. and that was all stuff that I came to uh, a bit late, but, um, but still to totally revered. Did you ever um, take any, well I've got two questions, kind of tied up. Did you take any lessons, but also did you ever take any lessons with the, the sort of the jazz artists that you were mentioning? Right? I'm just intrigued mm. to know whether it was something that you studied formally or if this is sort of stuff that's you just learn along the way. How did it? How did it look like for you? Yeah, I didn't. I never took any formal lessons. Mm. Um, I I ask a, a lot of questions. Of, of I talked to Tom was so great to me. Tom Gray was mm -hmm. such a mentor, and and he would always take time for me. And I was just a little kid, just sort of following him around, you know, at festivals. Mm. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't really have access to anybody. And where I lived, I mean, now I think about it, there probably might have been some base teachers at, at some of the local colleges, but I would, I grew up in a very, very rural area. Mm -hmm. So there, there was just nothing there. And there, was, there wasn't even a, a, a base in the school band or the school orchestra or anything that, where I went to school. So um, my exposure was to being at music festivals, bluegrass festivals, and being around other those players. So I would just sit and I'd watch them, I'd, I'd listen to them, um, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, every now and then I might get a, a lesson or two from somebody. But now, since I've been in town here, mm. I've tried to take advantage of, you know, like, talking to a few people and like, you know, picking their brains. So who are the kind of your peers that you admire then? I mean, obviously we've mentioned Mike Burb and Todd Phillips. I'm sure that you've talked base a lot with those, uh, mm. with those guys. I mean, there's such a diverse scene here. Yeah. You know, who are the, some of the other bass players in the national scene that you, you know, um, yeah, that, you, that are your peers that you're excited about with that playing? Oh, Dennis Crouch. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And he yeah. seems to have played on everything. Uh, He's his name played on everything. His name comes <laughs> up again and again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, just um, I mean, and uh, folks like Mark Schatz, he doesn't he, so he doesn't actually live here full time now, but um, he did live here for a long time. And uh, um, is he playing with Be Bela Fleck at the uh, Bela Fleck at the moment with, on this is. tour? He, he yeah. is. Yeah, he's doing he's doing um, the the my blue, my. Bluegrass it's heart. heart. Yeah, yeah, they're going out next week, aren't they? They are. It's, I was yeah. watching. I was being inspired by one of their videos uh, just a couple of days ago, and uh, mm. yeah, he is there in the background. So, yeah. it's a funny story with Mark because Mark and I have known each other for years and years and years, and yeah. um, and good, been good good friends. Um, and in the early days before I moved to town, um, he used to say, you need, you know, when he first got here, and then he would say, you need to come to Nashville, you need to move to Nashville. That's yeah. everyone's doing it, you need to move yeah. to Nashville. And I, um, and I was like, why? The first thing I said was, why in the world would I want to move to Nashville? But um, eventually, you know, I was like, oh, I get it. Like, and then I remember seeing him not long after I moved. I, it's like, Mark, I moved to Nashville. I'm so excited. And he goes, you shouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> and 
<laughs> we laugh about that. He's like, and, and I think he was like feeling uh, um, a little bit like, the, you know, the work was being eaten up by various people yeah. and, you know, it wasn't quite the scene that he thought it would be. And we've, we've laughed about it since then and many times like, he shouldn't have come. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what? Uh, stealing our gigs. But it's, <laughs> no, it was absolutely the right thing for all of us to do. Yeah, there's a real community here. I mean, I was wondering if we could maybe wrap up the conversation um, and I'm hoping we might return to, uh, in another video, maybe to talk about um, education and teaching and what have you. But just to wrap up this discussion, one of the things about Nashville that's so exciting is the younger players, I, I think, that are kind of on the scene who are just playing such virtuosic music. You know, bluegrass is just this huge space. You know, it's, this, it's so much more than... Um, what we think of in terms of traditional playing, there's so many exciting young players, and of course you've worked with Paul Cowart at Artist Works, mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you could speak about, well, perhaps Paul, and, and, and you know, and if people don't know his play and they really need to be checking it out, um, but it was very cool that you two collaborated. Oh, yeah, he, and he is just, he's a beautiful soul and, and very giving um, with his talent, and, um, and, and definitely somebody, if you're playing bass at all in any genre, he's a player that you would want to uh, seek out, study. Um, but it, particularly what's so great about him is he's clearly like, he's coming from a, a, um, a, a classical background and, and, a, and a very knowledgeable background from the bass, but, he's, but he has completely immersed himself within the the roots tradition of, of this music and gets it at this level so he can, he, so he's able to do what many players I think um, would love to be able to do which is like be, live in both worlds beautifully. Yeah. And and I think that's, um, he, he's definitely someone that should be high on your list of someone to pursue and listen to. And it's interesting actually because of course you do have, um, you know, you have Edgar Meyer here. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he's, uh, uh, you know, a Nashville um, uh, bass player and, and then you have his influence coming down and players. So Paul Cowart, his work with the Punch Brothers, you know, mm -hmm. it's such exciting music. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other ba younger bass players you want to um, give a shout out to? There's one or two else that were coming to mind. Is there anyone else that you oh, are inspired? I mean, I, I know there's so many, but is there anyone else that inspires well, you? Well, there's there's several that inspire me just because of what they're doing on a daily basis. Uh, folks like Vicky Vaughn, who's a great singer and and songwriter and and bass player. Ashley Cottle, who's another great uh, bass player singer. Um, and songwriter and and these women are 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 doing so much they're uh with with the bass and and with leading bands and because well, Vicky and, leads her own band as well isn't she right uh, yeah because I when I I mean she leads her own band she also plays with Della May and she and you used to play with Della May as well is that right I I have I I get I'm an honorary sub oh, that's, that's kind of <laughs> I've never actually been a part of the of the band but I've yeah. but I've been um but I've subbed a lot with them, and I've, they're they're definitely. I'm, I feel like I'm part of the sisterhood with them. But they. Um, but I think that the when I was um, as I was growing up and and playing music, I didn't know there were I, there were other women bass players. There were a few yeah. within bluegrass, and they were very important, um, like Ruth McLean and Cheryl White and um, folks like that. But there. Uh, I, there weren't any women that I saw who were leading a band as a bass player yes. doing what I do. And so when I started my first band, it was like, okay, I just have to do this. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm, 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 doing, it. I'm doing it. And folks were kind of like, oh, it's a bass player and she's leading this band. You know, so it was a little bit, it was kind of different. But now there's just so many great, you know, women and men doing yeah. doing it. And Are there it any other female really bass great. players that we can, uh, you know, reference here? So we have uh, Vicky Bourne. Who would, uh, yeah. Yeah. Who else? You mentioned somebody else. I just missed. Uh, 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 Ashley Cottle, um, yeah. Zoe Gigan, uh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> messing up her name. Uh, she plays with Della May. Uh, she's awesome. She she Vicky's playing with Della May now, but she was the bass player before that. 
And of course, uh, Bridget Kearney from Lake Street Dive. You know they're playing in Nashville uh, t uh, outside of town tomorrow, I think. Yeah. You know, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. I mean, unfortunately, due to the, the schedule and uh, what have you, I'm not able to go. But I love Lake Street Dive. Oh, me too. And again, actually, they've got a cool video with them playing outside on the sidewalk, which makes me think about your uh, Darling Pal of Mind video, where <laughs> you're, the way they start as well. Well, listen, Missy, it's been so wonderful to chat to you. Um, today. Thank you for coming and joining me here. It's been a real pleasure to be uh, you know, a visitor in your wonderful town and learn more about bluegrass music. Um, where can people go to learn about you? Because of course we, you have your, well, let, well, I'll let you explain. So you have yeah. your website, but also you have your own online school as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, I have my website, it's missyrains.com and you can find sort of pretty much everything there. Um, but I also, as, as you mentioned, I, I do teach through um, uh, an online platform called artistworks.com. Yep. And um, yeah. so you can find, find me there in that school and it's um, the School of Bluegrass Bass. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, I'll, yeah, certainly be uh, uh, checking out everything that you're doing and a personal uh, recommendation to everyone to, of course, go and check out the Darling Pal of Mine video that we've been discussing. I'm sure that you'll be curious enough to, uh, to watch that and hopefully you'll enjoy as much as I do. So, Missy, thank you for joining me today. Thank, Thank you, everybody at home, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much.